on Jack. So, good morning, everyone. I would like to use this opportunity to introduce some, I would say, rather elementary aspects uh, of functional theory in the context of bosons, which then might be pretty useful for the following talks, for instance, by Julia and Carlos. So actually, before I want to discuss RDMFT in more detail and apply to bosons, I'd like to share with you my general perspective uh, and I kind of developed the last two years on why we should uh, work on functional theories. Okay, and uh, be very curious to hear also the next few days uh, your opinion on this perspective, uh, because I think it should make a very strong case why functional theory would be the right way to go for the scientific community. So let's first study like wave function based methods from a very conceptual point of view. Okay, so it's very really rough picture. Okay, it's only qualitative. Huh? So to, one of the most important questions we can ask at the very beginning is what is the grounded energy of our system? So I give you a Hamiltonian of an n particle system could be fermions or bosons. And then to determine the grounded energy, we just minimize this energy expectation value over all n particle quantum states psi n. And this would then, in principle, if you could execute this, uh, lead to the ground state energy. So this entire approach, at least in principle, could be applied to every Hermitian operator on our n fermion Hilbert spacer. They don't see the slides online. OK. Uh, all right. No, share, but the wrong uh, uh -huh. Sorry about that. Make sure that it changed there. They said cannot see it there. Okay, they can see it. As you can see it there. Okay, thank you. So, and this approach, you know, like uh, if you just don't care about numerical quality and accuracy in principle, just the software code you write there to execute this minimization in principle, you could apply it to every. Hermitian operator on this very high dimensional n particle Hilbert spacer. For instance, Hartley Fock or full CI in principle, you could try to fit an arbitrary Hamiltonian and press enter. Maybe you will wait forever. But the method itself is not really, it's really a method which in principle could be applied to every Hamiltonian, at least on this rough level. Okay. But actually, because the underlying Hilbert space is exponentially large, so this, uh, this plane here should be like the entire. A space of all the emission operators so extremely high dimensional for realistic systems. Okay, this is an exponentially large space. So if, if we increase the system size, add more and more particles to our system, more fermions or bosons, more lattice more orbits, you get this exponential scaling. So what I'm claiming is in general, from that point of view, such wave function based methods to some degree they're an overkill because you could apply them to every system to also complete unrealistic Hamiltonians, at least in principle. But actually, what are we interested in? We're not interested in solving the ground set problem for every Hamiltonian, every Hamiltonian matrix on the n-particle Hilbert space. The first uh, simplifying structures, uh, we have to be quite often pair interacting systems, okay, not always. Uh, so in quantum optics, it's different. Nuclear physics is also different. But what's definitely for sure is quite often we have a fixed pair interaction, particularly in quantum chemistry, it's a Coulomb interaction. Nobody wants to vary the Coulomb interaction. So therefore, the interaction, which I denote by W, is fixed. Okay, so this is illustrated in this cartoon here. So I have the zero point of the zero point of my system. <laughs> so we first fixed the induction, okay. So W, so it just represents an operator in this space from zero. And now the point is, for which Hamiltonians do we want to solve the ground state problem? Well, you want to vary the one part of the Hamiltonian, which means the kinetic energy, for instance, in optical lattice systems, more importantly, the external potential. And if you are kind of very open-minded and would like to say, you would like to solve now the ground state problem for every one part of the Hamiltonian, which we could add to our system, it would give rise to an affine space of Hamiltonians of interest, just this blue line. And for every point on this blue line, we want to solve the ground set problem, at least in principle. And it definitely doesn't make sense from that point of view in quantum chemistry 
to develop a, a effective theory, a variation theory, for instance, which allow you to determine the ground state for points which are outside of this blue line. Okay, now what does this lead to? Well, you need to ask yourself what is, I mean, how do we parameterize such an affine space, this blue line here? Well, we parameterize it by the one part of the Hamiltonian. So which part of the quantum state do you need to know in order to be able to calculate expectation values of one part of the Hamiltonian? Well, according to Ries representation theorem, it's quite obvious, it's the one part of the reduced density matrix. So this is the reason why I refer to this one part of the reduced density matrix or operator gamma hat as the conjugate variable of H hat. So therefore, from a general point of view, it's not surprising that the function theories exist. And in that case, you would obtain an energy function, you would obtain the ground state energy for fixed W pen action as function of the variable one part of the Hamiltonian by minimizing this overall energy function. So this, uh, the gamma allows you to calculate in a direct way the one part of energy via this inner product. And then it turns out there exists a universal function, which means it's independent of the one part of the Hamiltonian H. And when you sum them together and you minimize this, you obtain the ground state energy. So I'm claiming that because functional theories try to exploit the fact that we as a community want to solve the ground state problem only for a specific class of Hamiltonians, it's a particular effective approach uh, to the ground state problem. Not if you want to solve one system at one day, but in your entire life as a community, we always want to solve the ground state problem for mole molecules, for instance, in quantum chemistry. And in wave function based methods, for instance, in, in physics departments, almost everyone is submitting, all the students are submitting DMRG calculations for random systems, and each calculation is submitted almost independently. And uh, you don't recycle the data from a previous calculation from the day before. In functional theory, it's different. People can approximate the function. And after doing this for 30 years, uh, and afterwards, we can calculate numbers for molecules and for all molecules. So. OK, so how about RDMFT for bosons? OK, from a general point of view, there's not so much to say, because I mean, Gilbert in his uh, paper from 1975, uh, I mean, the theorem applies also to bosons. So it's just about identical particles, identical fermions, identical bosons. You can prove the existence of universal function. And that's it. So here, again, what it means is, we fix a pair interaction W, might be contact interaction of uh, ultra cold, I mean, a gas of ultra cold atoms or molecules. Uh, then we vary the one part of the Hamiltonian, which means maybe an external potential, like a trapping potential, or the hopping rate of the um, bosons on the lattice, which can be varied nowadays. Uh, so it's, I think, quite exciting. So this also indicates why maybe RDMFT rather than DFT, because in DFT, you need to keep the kinetic energy fixed. Uh, And again, the parent action should be fixed here. And this directly leads to a functional theory of the one RDM. Okay, this is um, general observation. So the one RDM here to, to introduce some notation, I denote it by gamma or gamma hat sometimes. You obtain it from the end part of the quantum state capital gamma by, in, by integrate, integrating out or tracing out all except one particle. Sometimes it's convenient to normalize it to the particle number because this allows us to interpret the eigenvalues of gamma the N alphas as occupation numbers, the so-called natural occupation numbers. Okay, but now you may wonder, okay, why bosons? And uh, this, uh, I think uh, for us, one reason why we believe that RDMFT should be considered as a theory for describing bosons, maybe this quite well-known penrose onsager criterion for Bose-Einstein condensation. So just to recall it, uh, so there's Bose-Einstein condensation present in your system, Whenever the largest eigenvalue and max of your one particle reduced density matrix, so this means nothing else than take the one RDM, take the psi, psi, the phi phi sandwich, so phi is a one particle state, could be, for instance, a momentum state, could be also like a, a Gaussian one particle state. So you maximize this expression over all possible one particle states in your one particle Hilbert space. So whenever this is proportional to the particle number, we say there's both Einstein conservation present. Okay, you can also actually. This kind of emphasizes uh, that the one RDM is the right quantity, you know, to talk about uh, both Einstein conservation in particular, like identified one RDM FT as a particular suitable theory. Okay, and maybe it was also interesting to keep in mind that also related effects like the quasi condensation, like in Tongshi Hado gas uh, um, for hardcore bosons. Uh, it's also like fragmented condensation where you have not only one state which is macroscopically populated. So it's not just about one orbital which is macroscopically occupied. So the full one RDM 
is here really the right important quantity. And uh, if you compare this to DFT, if I give you the density of a system, and ask you, is both Einstein conservation present or not? Most probably you cannot answer the question. So just think about homogeneous system with fixed filling factor. <laughs> I mean, it's always the same density, um, it's constant, but in some scenarios you have both Einstein conservation and some others not. Okay, so let me continue. Like a second huge advantage of uh, bosons compared to fermions from the point of view of one RDMFT is the following. So in general, so you have the two important sets in functional theory. Um, I mean, the domains of those functions. Uh, so one is uh, the set PP. This is a set of all one particle reduced density matrices, which is corresponding to a pure n particle quantum state. While the set PE, which is uh, typically larger, is a set of all one particle density matrices, which could emerge from n particle ensemble state. So for fermions, the, the letter set here, this PE, is just described by the Pauli exclusion principle. While the former set is PP, this is characterized by additional generalized Pauli constraints. You know, that Alexander Gliatschko recently found in his mathematical breakthrough, these extremely complicated constraints, as you know, and is uh, hampering, I think, RDMFT, that these constraints uh, are playing a role, okay? But actually in bosons, in, system, in bosonic systems, it's quite different there. The bosonic system, without any effort, you can directly see does these two sets coincide? Uh, and to observe it is, we just construct a quantum state for a given one RDM. So you give me a one RDM, okay? So it's automatically Hermitian. As I wrote it down here in this spectral decomposition, we assume that the occupation numbers are between zero and N because we have N bosons, so you cannot have larger occupation numbers. They're non-negative as well. So you can just write down this bosonic quantum state here. And apparently it maps to one RDM. So this shows there are no non trivial constraints on the domain of, uh, pure and representable one audience. And this is pretty good. So no complicated generalized Pauli constraints in contrast to fermions. So now in the second part, I just would like to study a toy model, a really simple model, just to get an idea about uh, how these some concepts look like, how does the function look like? Might it be fruitful to explore this in more detail afterwards? So for this, we study the Harper dimer. Okay, it just means two lattice sites. You have a lattice side on the left side on the, and one on the right side, just like next to each other. And the particles can hop between these two lattice sides. So it's kind of a primitive approximation to kind of a double well potential, which is like a minimal basis set. And then we consider N bosons in this uh, system. Okay, it's, uh, they also have like microscopic many, then it's getting a little more artificial, the model, because then you would activate more orbitals, but just like a model, okay, to get an idea. So here's the Hamiltonian, there are three terms. One is just, the hopping with a rate T between the left and right side. So these are bosonic creation annihilation operators. Then you have an external potential on these two lattice sides to get some asymmetry. And then you have the common Hubbard, the both Hubbard on site interaction, the coupling strength U, which I assume here to be positive. I think in the following slides, but in general, it can be positive or negative. Um, and then whenever you have more than one part of the side, you get the interaction energy. So just to for the clarification or to avoid confusion, we are talking really about a really primitive, simple setting here. The one part density matrix gamma, just a two times two matrix. So uh, we're restricting here to real numbers. So we have here just real numbers for real numbers. The normalization fixes one of the diagonal guys uh, and the other one is just given by N minus the other one. And then these two guys are also then, I mean the same. Uh, okay, so we have effectively two free parameters to describe the one RDM. So how does the domain look like? Well, without little effort, you can prove the following. Just assume the one RDM has to be positive semi-definite, and then it directly follows uh, when you use gamma LL and gamma LR as the variable, you obtain a disk. Okay, so this is illustrated here. So here, just see a disk. By the way, here, silently, I changed the normalization. So now I'm normalizing the guys again to one. Okay, it has some advantages because it allows us to compare different particle numbers in a minute. So, because gamma is a two times two matrix, I can easily diagonalize it. I introduce the corresponding eigenstates. One eigenstate, I just call it a phi, and the other eigenstate, I call it phi perp with some prefactors. And this now refers to this picture here. So here you see the, the disk, this entire domain, okay? And uh, because it's a, a disk, I just introduce uh, these polar coordinates. So we have like the angle phi here between zero and two pi, okay? You can walk in a circle here. And I introduce 
heck is the radial distance, but actually I take one, one half minus the radial distance. So I introduce uh, the D, which is just the radius of this disk uh, um, minus, minus, minus the distance to the inner point. Uh. Okay, so if you like, you could also now relate uh, these two states, phi and phi perp, to the original reference basis states L and R. Okay, it's not so important. I guess you understand the picture, what, what, what I have in mind here. What's however more important is to emphasize what both Einstein condensation would correspond to in this uh, simplified model here. Namely, both Einstein condensation, I mean, if you would like to call it like this, it would correspond to a parameter d equals zero because d equals zero means you are on the boundary. Okay, and if you plug this into the formula, you see this eigenvalue is zero and this eigenvalue here is one. So it exactly means that the occupation number of the state phi is equal to n. Okay, so some says you could maybe call it both Einstein condensation if you want. Okay, so how about functions? Well, I would like to recall the Levy leap constraint search. Okay, he's a, a typo. So this should be like uh, n here. So for n particles, you have two functions, namely depending on whether you want to use pure states or ensemble states to address your ground, ground set problem. Okay. And uh, on a formal level, for every one RDM gamma in this disk, which I presented to you, you could calculate, at least in principle, the value of the function at this point by minimizing the interaction energy of the interaction Hamiltonian W over all those n particle states, big capital gamma, which are either pure states or ensemble states mapping to the given one RDM. This is con the constraint search formalism. Okay, so it's a very elegant expression to derive analytical properties. Uh, okay, in practice, of course, it's uh, difficult because it's a ground set problem with a constraint. Okay. Um, for two bosons, however, one can execute this uh, without too much effort. It's a nice exercise for young students. Uh, um, by the way, strongly connected, of course, to the two electron Hubbard dimer in the singlet sector. It's, I mean, exactly the same up to a shift of the energy. And what you obtain is the following is a function now of uh, d and phi, okay? And what you see is uh, okay, it's proportional to u. And there's some interesting term here. So, proportional to sine squared of phi and some square root expression depending on d, okay? I mean, later in one minute, I'll show you a plot, okay? So, it's just like the formula which you obtain. You may wonder how about the ensemble function where we use here not pure states for the big gamma, but all ensemble states, okay? It's like a more complicated minimization. But then you can have one advantage, the functions getting convex, okay? And uh, this is a general mathematical result, which I presented to you on Monday. So if you want to calculate the ensemble function for any type of system, also for fermions, the function is given by the lower convex envelope of the pure function. So this is the largest convex function, which is all everywhere small or equal to your original function. Okay, this is exactly illustrated here in this, uh, in this picture here. So. So the three columns that are shown, which are shown here is, are for different particle numbers. Here's n equal two, this is n equal four, and this is n equal infinity. And you can easily guess how it will look like n equal three, five, 17, or whatever. So I've presented three rows. In the first row, it's the pure function. In the second row, the ensemble function, okay? The ensemble function, as you can see, is everywhere convex as I promised to you. In particular, you can also see or guess that the ensemble functions are given by the lower convex envelope of the pure function. You can more or less guess it, I guess. But you also see, by the way, here, okay, so may, quite funny, in the limit of n to infinity, also the pure function is getting convex, so it's getting pretty simple. Um, so you may want, okay, what is shown here? So you like that we have this domain, this entire disk here. This entire disk describes all the one part density matrices which are mathematically speaking compatible to an n Fermi quantum state. But this doesn't mean that all these one RDMs can show up as ground set one RDMs. So which means you vary the one part of the Hamiltonian, which means the hopping and the relative potential. Then you can ask, please calculate the ground state, calculate the one RDM, which one RDMs can you find? Not every one RDM is possible. Only those one RDMs shown in orange are possible, okay? And the point is, this is, this is the so-called V representability problem to determine the one part density matrices for which there exist a, a non-local external potential called V, I called it actually H in my presentation, such that the one RDM shows up as a physical ground state one RDM. And in principle, one cannot solve this problem at all. But here's one example where you can go beyond N equal two 
and can solve the problem. And we managed to solve it comprehensively. Like uh, for every particle number, you get always these kind of ellipsoids, uh, this filled ellipses, uh, and it's getting arbitrarily complicated. Uh, okay. So this is just like, a, a, I think, a remark which might be interesting for the community. Uh. So there's one now funny observation that we can now make based on those uh, exact results for the functions, numerical exact for arbitrary part of the number, analytical for n equal two, namely that if you take the gradient, for instance, uh, for the n equal two function, respect to the distance to the boundary of this disk, you observe that it diverges repulsively, you know, minus d to the one half when you come close to the boundary. So that's quite remarkable, except for two very specific phi values, okay? And the point is now, and this is what I don't want to present in detail, but I would like to refer to, to our paper here. Uh, we developed like an in general mathematical toolbox for a two-dimensional system, I mean, a two-lattice side system, arbitrary party number, which allows you to get full mathematical control over the following sequence. So we can kind of vary the Hamiltonian, the one-party Hamiltonian, in order that the quantum state moves in a very specific way such that the one RDM walks in a straight line away from the boundary, okay? So with such a mathematical toolbox, we get at the end in levy leap constraint search a full control over all properties like the function, the one RDM and so on. And with this toolbox that we presented in the supplemental material, you could then derive the following results, namely that the gradient of the universal function for every part of the number, is like the analytical result in leading order, behaves as minus, okay, here U is positive in this example. If you allow for negative U, you should take a, a minus the modulus of U, okay, times uh, D to minus one half, okay. So this from a practical point of view means uh, you can never reach the boundary independent of the one part of the Hamiltonian which you add to the pair interaction, okay. So this means uh, in more physical terms, complete condensation, so mathematically complete condensation, which means D equals zero is not possible. And this is just like, like a spoiler to, to anticipate what Yule is going to present uh, to make you very excited for more realistic systems like Bose-Einstein condensates in the bogolia buff regime, which we're kind of effectively talking about here anyway. The gradient of the universal function respect kind of to the distance of the boundary of this domain, which is a more complicated, the, the boundary, turns out to behave as one, as minus one divided by square root of one minus the condensate fraction. So in the denominator, this is like the square root of the quantum depletion. So now you can see it's not possible in nature for interacting bosons to have a, a perfect Bose-Einstein condensate. Of course, we already knew this uh, since a pretty long time, but I think what's so nice here is uh, that this new concept of a Bose-Einstein force uh, provides a geometric explanation because it refers to the geometry of quantum states. I mean, it provides a geometric or universal explanation for, for quantum depletion. So let me summarize this. So I hope I could make a, like a strong case for one RDMFT in, in bosonic systems. So it could be particularly ideal. Um, so first of all, the BC, I mean, the criterion for BC for arbitrary systems, including inhomogeneous systems refers to the one RDM and there are no channels Pauli constraints. So I think these are two quite important reasons why RDMFT for bosons should be even more successful than for fermions. And the second type of result we found in this toy model, the Hubbard diamond of N bosons, uh, we obtained the functions, numerically exact or analytical. Then we established a kind of a new concept, at least in the system of so-called that Bose-Einstein force, uh, um, which can also exist in realistic Bose-Einstein condensates as Julia is going to present in a few seconds. Uh. And then this, by referring to this both Einstein condensate force, we could we revealed actually a universal explanation of quantum depletion. So this is an explanation which is completely independent of all the microscopic details of the system. Doesn't matter how your interaction looks like, whether it's two-part interaction or n-part interaction, whether you have like external potential or no external potential, whether you have long-range hopping or non-long-range hopping. Okay. We cannot say, of course, how the physics looks like for a concrete system, but we can say if you want to have find a system with exact condensation, complete condensation, it's not possible because of this principle. Okay, and then by the way, just for you uh, guys, so we also have a solution of the representability problem of a system beyond two particles. Uh, and I think the solution looks arbitrarily complicated to kind of follow the route of Levy and Vallone to use the constraint search formalism. So thank you very much for your attention.